Anyone here whitewater boaters? No? Anyone here whitewater boaters? Hard shell whitewater boaters? There used to be a really active uh, club on uh, campus, in the outing club, but I guess it used to be kind of a nice uh, link between town and gown. Oh, they started putting adverts in these things? Uh, but now I, I think that is not here so much. Some administrative things that Penn State did kind of killed it off a little while ago. I suppose the other good thing for State College uh, is that uh, we're right at the headwaters of all the drainage systems, so threats like uh, flash floods are less severe than they are much further downstream where the the rivers crest later with some delay in them. Uh, tends to react quite quickly up here, but less, uh, less magnitude. And so it didn't seem too bad in State College. Uh, it certainly seemed that Ivan, 17 years ago, was worse uh, where I lived anyway. The, the river was lower. All right. Quite interesting. All right. All right. Did I, did I click to exit full screen? All right. Let's go. Not running. I guess it is running, but it's just running slowly. So as we kind of warm up here, uh, you know, we're talking about fluid pressures, how they change with depth. You know, a classic example of that would be drilling mud or drilling fluid that's used in holes for hydrocarbons, ge drilling geothermal wells, scientific drilling, drilling water wells. The whole idea is that the fluid pressure, fluids that you put in them, uh, exert some pressure on the walls and they stop the wells, well walls from uh, collapsing. In addition to, they're typically circulated down the middle of the drill string into the bit. They flush the, the cuttings uh, at the bottom of the hole up around the outside of the, the bit. So, so the fluid would circulate down the center of this. Oh, you see it right there. You would come out here, flush the cuttings up to the surface. You can see what's going on at the surface by looking at the cuttings, see what the rock you're in. Uh, but the main feature of it is to be able, well, one of the many features is to be able to keep the hole open by the pressure that exerts. And so drilling fluids can be air for lots of water wells around here. Uh, drilling fluids are often water. Uh, you have to supply water and bring it on site. And in deep wells, they tend to be muds. And muds are what we've called Fixotropic fluids, when we talked about viscosities, they have some, if you leave them to be still, they have some shear strength to them, and it takes some force to be able to, to shear it with a vein. Um, uh, but once they're sheared, they act as kind of Newtonian fluids. I don't know why that means. Um, and, uh, but anyway, so drilling fluids are a, a science uh, in themselves to be able to allow you to drill to depths. I don't know. I'm not sure what the deepest hole is, certainly 15,000 feet or 5,000 meters is not uh, uncommon. The Marcellus wells around here are about 9,000 feet or 3,000 meters. So applications of what we've got. Uh, same thing, I think. Probably the most exciting thing about... Well, I guess this is a bit more local. So instead of drilling deep wells down to 3,000 uh, meters in the Marcellus here, uh, wells for residential heat pumps, so same technology, you drill a well, you try and keep it open with mud. Uh, it's down to, I think in this case, 300 feet, 100 meters. And in that well, you then install a U-tube, you know, one inch diameter household uh, like PVC pipe uh, that you can circulate cold water down and get warm water up. You're just removing the heat from the ground. 
You know, typically ground is at about 10 degrees centigrade or 55 degrees Fahrenheit here, uh, and actually over most of the US. And so you can use that as an internal heat source to be able to heat in the wintertime and cool in the summertime with a heat pump. And so you'd use the same kind of techniques to be able to, to do that. So, so just to make the point that what we're doing is actually relevant to some things. Uh, this will be what we deal with next week. I think it's actually subtitled. So we talked about, well, I was alive for this one, just, uh, you weren't. So uh, dams, we looked at a dam, in uh, Tailings Dam at an iron, ore, iron mine in Brazil that collapsed on the first day of classes. This is uh, a series of dams that failed in the late 1950s and 60s that really alerted uh, people to the, the danger of dams being upstream of them. Obviously, if you're downstream of a dam and it collapses, then that's sometimes not, not very good. And so these are magnificent structures. Uh, it's in the south of France. Uh, was occupied by the Romans. I'm sure this is, uh, you yeah, okay, know, I can read that as well. And uh, the Malpasse Dam was one that uh, failed because, uh, not because the dam failed, the dam still exists there, but because the abutment where it gets keyed into the side of the valley uh, failed itself. So it's an arch dam, very thin, uh, concrete shell that spans the valley. The uh, upstream part is upwards on this. Well, you can see it there. Uh, probably, certainly you've seen, may have seen uh, arch dams. Quite elegant in, in many respects. Uh, it was being filled and uh, was quite a spectacular structure, except the, the weakest link in that, as many structures have to be designed for what the weakest component is. Uh, the abutment moved, the, the rock shifted along a fault, and as a result of, uh, of that, it discharged all the the fluid in the in the dam. So I'm not sure how quickly it gets to that part. There must be some. Yeah. So this is the before and after. So the abutment moved. Uh, the dam cracked. It started leaking through the dam, and as a result of that, uh, it discharged all of the reservoir. The reservoir can be quite volumetric, quite large volumes. And I think on the left-hand side, you see just a model that's looking at the topography, the DEM of the topography, with the, uh, the surge wave going downstream and washing away everything in its past, path. So, so again, just to kind of make the point. So we're talking about fluid pressures at a point. Obviously, if the dam moves, it, da it moves because it's a fluid pressure at a point integrated over the whole back of the dam. And so what we're interested in is the integrated force that comes from that. And so that's our next topic next week, not today but to take our knowledge of what pressures do with depth and to be able to evaluate that over surface so that we can calculate forces on structures. Whether the, the roof, the lid will come off your airplane when you're flying, whether a dam will collapse, whether you can keep a gate closed, etc. And so, so that is our task for, for next week. And what else do we have? Whoops, I didn't mean to do that, I guess. Oh, that was my favorite one. And of course, uh, I think this is kind of a funny one. So this seems like an interesting thing to, for me to someone to do. <laughs> and so I, I don't know what, how you get down. Perhaps I think you might have a rifle to be able to shoot the balloons to get down. Uh, but yeah, I'm not sure I would uh, be choosing to do, to do that. So on the lighter side, and of course, as we talked last time, balloons, if you look at uh, how they work, they work because the density of the gas, typically a glass, the fluid in the balloon is less dense than the material around it, it's buoyant, and therefore as a result of that, it can happen if you reorganize the ideal gas equation to give you density as pressure divided by RT, you can do it by either decreasing pressure or increasing uh, R or increasing T. Make it hotter, change the gas to helium, or try and uh, reduce the pressure inside the balloon. And of course, if you reduce the pressure inside these balloons, they'll just collapse. They have no structural uh, strength applied to them. So that's that. Oh yeah, we're, we have time to do what we're doing today. And of course, 
the other thing from our early warning last time, I can't imagine anything more uh, frightening. It happened in um, Zhengzhou in China a couple of months ago, right? Uh, uh, six inches of rain or uh, a foot and a half of rain over a couple of hours. A bunch of people got trapped in a subway uh, in that city. This is New York City. I can't imagine anything more frightening than being trapped in a subway where all the exit points are the ingress points for water, which you obviously can't fight up against. So, kind of re-established or redefined our thoughts of what flash floods are now. I never really kind of thought of them relevant to um, cities, city life. It's something you see in the countryside, in the desert, for instance, when water comes up quickly. And so, so maybe it's recalibrated some of the things we do. So anyway, so that's where we are for now. Let's get rolling. Um, today we will finish off our material on fluid pressures at a point. And so, um, as usual, maybe we'll spend a couple of minutes just uh, recapping what we've done. I'll go back to some exp um, expressions that we didn't deal with before. Um, but you remember from last time, uh, we know that pressures act in all directions at the same magnitude if the fluid is static. We know that if acceleration is zero, then these two expressions are important to us. This is always true irrespective of gas or liquid, uh, but how we deal with it changes depending on those. To integrate it to give us this expression for a liquid and integrate it, this expression for a gas, we've talked about that in the last two periods, so I won't go back through that. But importantly, pressures as you go horizontally within a fluid uh, don't change. And you can imagine that that's true because if you look at how pressures change within a static fluid, and you draw how pressures change as a function of depth, then we know that they vary uniformly. And so if you take any particular depth that you want to move at and go across it, this is by definition the case it has to be. It doesn't matter if there is a wall between those of some kind, so long as the fluids are, are connected to each other in some way as we've seen before in our manometer equations. So that's an important uh, relationship for us. And the fact that fluid pressures change with depth is also important because it comes into what we said last time about what we call the manometer rules. And so the manometer rules are pretty straightforward. We kind of used them last time. In shorthand, uh, if you go up, you reduce pressures. You can see that here, if you go up. If you go down, you increase pressures by adding them. And typically, you'd add them just by the amount of the elevation change times the unit weight. Um, if you go across from one location to another, so long as you're connected in a path between the two, you can put those pressures as being the same as each other, which we did. Um, if the tube is evacuated, like for the barometer, Thumb, or, thumb over the mercury, turn it upside down. Initially, the tube is completely full. And then when you take your thumb off the mercury and put it in a mercury bath, it pulls down and it vaporizes. You get vapor pressure in the top. So the vapor pressure then exi exists. And the vapor pressure is typically tiny. It's almost, it's very close to absolute zero pressure. And so sometimes you can take it that and sometimes not. And we saw that it was 0 0.003 of an atmosphere so 3% um, of, the, of the atmospheric pressure. So it's really trivial compared to anything else. And if we go up and down in a gas, we can typically take that as being of zero uh, density. And so the reason for that is that if we draw a path with pressure versus depth, the pressure change versus depth for a liquid is this. The gradient of this is controlled by this parameter here. For a liquid, it's the red one. For a gas, it will look like the black one. And so even less than that. 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, one kilogram per cubic meter. So a thousandth of it. And so typically, we'll ignore it when we deal with it. So we talked about all of those last time. I just want to 
clear up two, two, two remaining components just quickly. Uh, use, so we'll use those manometer rules in some examples today. Big, big time on examples. But just to make the point that you can use it in different ways, uh, an inclined tube manometer uses the idea that if you have a vertical tube and you're measuring the elevation change between two locations, perhaps the resolution of that is quite small. Perhaps it's only a couple of inches apart and it's, and it's difficult to get that magnitude. If you, instead of drawing it as a vertical tube, I guess it'd be like this. So instead of having it as a, a vertical, so this would be an alternative arrangement for the tube. You could have it like this, I suppose, and it would go into this. Then measuring the difference between the elevations uh, in between this point here, this would obviously, of course, all be filled with red fluid on the way. What you could do is you could lay the tube down because then you're measuring the, the, the length of the tube as opposed to the vertical elevation. So if you did that, you could use this to measure this height, h2, as a function of this length, l2, sine theta. So this is theta in here. And so we can use this observation that's just a trigonometric. Uh, you're, we're substituting the vertical height of this triangle, uh, which would be this magnitude, h2. This is h2. And we have the hypotenuse of this triangle, and we have another length along here. So this is just representing that. So when you write the equation, as we have done before, we start from one point PA, we go down a certain amount, so we add a fluid pressure H1 times this unit weight. We go across uh, here to this point, we go up from this point all the way to here. This height is H2. So this magnitude here has to be h2 times gamma 2. I'm just writing it above. And then to go up this final step here, it's h3 unit weight of this. We're going up, so it's negative. And that equals the pressure in this pipeline. They're not orbs. They're pipelines going into the page. And so all we can do is we can realize that this value of h2, we can substitute with this term here. And so we'd end up with a length measurement along the length of the tube rather than the height measurement as the difference between the things. Importantly, the, the length measurement has to be between this point here, where this would intercept, and this point here. Uh, but it gives, it gives you better resolution, as you can imagine. The other thing is that if the fluids in the pipelines, fluid in pipe A and fluid in pipe B, are both gases, then we can set this to zero, and we can set this to zero. And if that's the case, then we these terms, this term and this term drop out, and we just have a normal manometer equation that the pressure difference between the two pipes is given by the elevation change H2, which of course is this. This value here is H2, gamma 2. So it's just the elevation difference between those and the unit weight of the fluid. So if it's a gas at one kilogram per cubic meter, if the manometer fluid is mercury, which isn't unusual, at 13,000 kilograms per cubic meter, then it's a factor of 10 to the 4 difference. And so we can actually do justify making each of these equal to zero. So that's manometry for us. Um, and obviously, you have control over the sensitivity. If you make this tube, instead of vertical, it's least sensitive. If you make it almost flat, it's incredibly sensitive because a small change in, H, in H2 is a big, long length of uh, the tube. And so you can change the sensitivity to, to suit your problem. So, interesting example. So man manometers are certainly used, um, but also other pressures are measured by other uh, methods. Um, the basic principle is that you have an instrument that typically deforms in some way, and you calibrate that deformation against the pressure that you apply. And so different methods would be to use a Bourdon tube, depending on how good your French is. 
Uh, Bourdon tube is just a curved tube like a balloon that the clown makes that has a curve into it. When you change the pressure, because it's got a curve into it, the curvature changes because it's got uh, a larger radius on the outside than on the inside. And so as you change the pressure in the tube, uh, it changes the action on it. And if you measure this displacement as it goes up or down with the LVDT, linear voltage displacement transducer, just a, um, a piece of metal that goes through a coil that can sense very accurately, maybe to a micron, the, um, the magnitude of the change here. You can calibrate that to say that if it moves a micron, 10 microns, it's a certain pressure change. These are also kind of, in the past, have been hooked up to dial gauges. So this up and down motion of the end of the tube has gone through kind of a cogged ratchet, the cog on the dial gauge and a vertical ratchet. So it goes down and it turns a dial against the tube. So very, very simple. Piezometers, you can imagine, pneumatic piezometers are just, uh, the idea is that you introduce some fluid at some pressure. You have a membrane across here. This spring membrane doesn't allow the fluid to pass through to the other side until it reaches the pressure that's exerted against it by the fluid which it's placed in. And as soon as it reaches that fluid pressure, there'll be a connection between the upstream and the downstream. And that pressure that you have to apply to get breakthrough has to be the, um, the pressure that you're fighting against. Again, you can uh, calibrate it for that. And then the more usual one is to use a pressure transducer. And a pressure transducer works on a similar idea. You have some kind of diaphragm, which is flexible. Pressure acts against the diaphragm from the outside. And what it does is it makes that diaphragm deflect. You measure that deflection with an LVDT, just like we did before. And you convert that deflection into an equivalent pressure by calibrating it. So very straightforward. And I guess piezoelectric cells, um, you add a force or a pressure to a, a silicon wafer, and it generates a voltage. And that voltage, again, is also calibrated against the pressure that's applied. So basic, basic ideas. Tire pressure gauge, I think, is a little bit different. It's usually, as you know, the old-fashioned ones. I guess you can get out digital ones these days. You put it in the tire. It pushes up a, a, a jet of gas against the, uh, some kind of stick inside it. I think that's just exerting a pressure that lifts this height above itself against uh, gravity to some magnitude, and that correlates somehow with the magnitude of the pressure that's being applied. So, a bunch of different ways we can imagine um, measuring pressures. So that's that's enough of that. Just yeah. so, just some practical applications, I guess, of what we're doing. So um, I thought we'd go through some examples. Um, and I think we'll certainly go through this. We won't go through this. Um, maybe we'll go through this. Certainly we'll go through this. And maybe we might talk about that. So we'll go through a, a few, just depending on, maybe uh, we um, triage it based on our time that we have available. We've got uh, 35 minutes, I think, or so. So it's probably enough time to go through these at a leisurely place. Um, so. Um, of course, some of these examples are a bit contrived, but perhaps you could see them as real, real situations. So this is uh, the idea that you could put a container with a outlet at the top in which you'd put fluid into another fluid, say water, and then you pull up this container to some height so that the water in here rises as you pull up the container, and you apply some force to it, R, that you need to do to be able to do it. Um, the tests, I know some of the questions are in English or imperial units. Some of the examples in this class are in imperial units. None of your test examples will be anything but SI. So depending on what you're more comfortable with, if you're comfortable with SI, SI are certainly logical compared to imperial units. And so the question is, um, if you do that and you pull it up with some force R, which you don't know, what is the magnitude of the height rise within this pipe if you know the other things about the, the fluids. Um, how would you do that? Well, what, what do we know first? I guess what we would like to know is we'd like to know, uh, ex we don't know what this height is, so we need to know exactly what the pressure is at this point in A. So what we could do uh, is that we could define 
the fact that PB, these are the same, right? This has to be atmospheric here because they're at the same elevation and you can write, move between one to get to it. So we could just cut this off and we know that the pressure acting here has to be zero. PB has to be zero. It has to be the same as the pressure acting down on this, this free surface. And so what we could do is we could start off by from this point here. And so if we did that, we would end up with PB. We have to go down to this point here. And to get to this point here, this is H minus 3 feet. times the unit weight of the gauge fluid, I guess. I think it's water in this particular case. Um, and then we need to go across here. And this would be, this would get us to this point here. H does this, is it for this? This would be equal to the unit weight of water times two feet. So we're going from this point here. PA has to equal P, PA prime, right? Pressure here has to equal the same pressure here because it's air. And we're saying that the unit weight of air essentially equals zero, making that. And so we're going to this point here. That gets us to this point here. And then to get to PB, I guess this is PB. Perhaps that's confusing. Let's call this PB prime. Let's call this PB prime. The point is that this is atmospheric, and this is also atmospheric. And so if you look at the individual terms of that, by definition, this is atmospheric. This is atmospheric. And so this is just replaced by B. And so the only term that we have that we don't really understand is going to be this term here. And so I guess we could rearrange this as 3 times H. Doesn't want to do that. Get rid of that. What am I talking about? H times unit weight of the gauge fluid is equal to three times the gauge fluid minus unit weight of H2O. My writing's not very good today. Times two. And if we divide both sides through by gauge fluid by the unit weight of water, then the gauge fluid in this case, I don't think it's said, but uh, open tank shown gravity, this has to be, this gauge fluid must be water. And so I should use color that you can actually see. So in this expression here, the gauge fluid divided by the unit weight of water has to be one, right? And the gauge fluid, uh, the gauge fluid here by the unit weight of water has to be cool, sorry, one. And the unit weight of H2 Oh, specific gravity of the manometer fluid is 2.5. So specific gravity is equal to the unit weight of the gauge fluid divided by the unit weight of water, which is 2.5. So uh, this is 2.5, not 1. Uh, this is 
not one. And this is one. And this turns out to be h is equal to three times out <laughs> yeah, it's horrible. so I'm not doing a very good job on this today is it it's a bad 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 deal so I'm gonna start again so we start at this point I can't get it all on the page uh, if I can't work it out so it's, what have I done wrong here h is equal to, anyone going to help me on this? Uh, h times the, the gauge fluid, to find, this is 2.5. Yeah, okay, that's right. So I've got 2.5 times h is equal to 3 times 2.5 uh, minus 2 times uh, one, and then divided by two point five. Yeah, it's wrong. Let's yeah. divide by two point five, and divide by two point five. Then I have h is equal to three minus two times one over. 2.5. These cancel out. 2 times 1 over 2.5. Yeah, okay. So, you, so it ends up being, after that uh, rather poor showing by me, that this uh, height here of this um, fluid has to be at a height of 2.2. So this height here is equal to, if we draw it on here, is 2.2. And so it's less, it's not higher than this, it's actually lower than this elevation, which is equal to 3. And so you know that if this is equal to some magnitude, and you go across here, and you have a higher value above you, you know that you're under positive pressure. If it's the opposite, that you're here, and you go to this point here, you know that you're under a negative pressure. And so as you'd expect, this value as you go up from here has to be a vacuum, a partial vacuum in here, and it has to be because it's sucking this up. And you know that that must be the case, of course, because if you draw a diagram that has pressure versus elevation, then you know that the pressure here with elevation has to look like this. And this value here has to be zero pressure atmospheric. Gauge pressure is zero. So as you go up to this point here, then the change in pressure that you have, this, this change in pressure at this point has to be minus 2 point, uh, well, it's e equal to minus 0 0.8 um, feet of mercury. That's the pressure that has to be applied there. So it's a vacuum in this point. And so that's why it's lifting things up. If you applied a positive pressure here, and you had these walls that went down, of course it would push the surface of the water down below the, the depth of the water. And so you could go across from this particular depth into the free water here, and those have, would have to be the same amount of pressure that you have from going down here. So you can do it a variety of different ways. Um, if you, I guess you could also calculate, you could ask the question, what is the value of R? And I suppose um, the easiest way to calculate that would be that the value of force that you'd have to apply would be equal to um, 2 feet times the unit weight of water times pi d squared upon 4, pi r squared. So this is the height, two feet. So the height of two feet multiplied by pi r squared is the volume by definition. So this term and this term. And if you multiply the volume times the unit weight, 
you end up with the force that you have to apply to lift this. It's not asking you that, but that's how you would do it if you wanted to do it. Okay. All right. Not my finest hour. Let's let's try another one. Let's not try that one. <laughs> so same same idea. So you, so you have to look at the the questions, I guess, and figure out exactly what uh, is being asked of you um, in each of these cases. Um, and so here, mercury manometer is used to measure the difference between two pipes. A fuel oil uh, is flowing in A. So there's a particular fuel oil here. There's a manometer fluid in the bottom, and there's a different fuel oil flowing in B. Um, there's an air bubble in here. So that's code to suggest that it's not the, uh, the fuel oil at its vapor pressure, but the fact that the elevation here and the elevation here in the bubble have to be the same if it's at some pressure. We don't know what the pressure is, but we know it's not at the vapor pressure. And so for this, we would uh, go through this. So we define, we don't know the pressure at A. This is the equation here that I'm just going to write out in longhand. A gets us to this point here. We have to go down to the first interface. So that, I guess, would be equal to 3 inches plus this depth here. So plus the unit weight of fluid A multiplied by the depth, which is 3 inches plus 18 inches. divided by 12 inches to a foot. I can just see it here. You're at this point here. You're moving through the same fluid to get to this point here. And so this would be going down to this point here. You're going down, so it's the unit weight of the gauge fluid. Uh, let's, let me write it not as gauge fluid, because that's confusing with gas. But let's do it as mercury, multiplied by 6 inches over 12. That gets us to this point here. That also gets us to this point here. Now we can go up here, so we're subtracting, minus the unit weight of fluid number B. And the length would be 6 plus 18 to get to this point. over 12. And that would get us here. Uh, these are at the same level because we go going across here because it's a bubble. And so we know that then this, this level here, just from the geometry, down to point B is going to be 2 inches, right? Because it's 3 inches above. So it would be going down, so it would be adding unit weight uh, of the fluid B. I'm going to start writing over here. So it's going to be equal to 2 inches over 12. And that has to equal the pressure B. So hopefully everything we've done there should be the, exactly the same as this. It's perhaps written out a bit more nicely. And so uh, we want to know the pressure difference PA minus PB. And so I won't do it, um, but uh, you know exactly how to do it here, is that you uh, Oh, we know the pressure, no, you know. So now we know the pressure PA. PSI. You've got to make the conversions, of course. And we also know the unit weights of all the fluids. So we know the unit specific weights are 53, 57, and uh, it's not given here for mercury, but we can calculate the weights of mercury. And so if you substitute the values for the unit weights of each of these, then the only term that we don't know is this term on the left-hand side. And it's given below. I won't go through it. 
So it's just a matter of figuring out what you know and what you need, need to know. So we want to write the pressure at point B. So as I said before, it's easiest to start at the point that you know and you work your way through to the point that you want to know just because the equation gets set up that way. And you see that's exactly the case here. You need to be able to figure out what the unit weights are of the fluids, the gauge fluid, and the two um, components. And that allows you to be able to figure out exactly the magnitude of this. Okay. All right, so I mean, pretty straight, relatively straightforward. So it's just a matter of kind of organizing things in, in your mind. Um, the final one, statutory one, that we'll do today, maybe we have some time left to do some others, is to work out um, the force that you have to apply on a form to have it not float off its foundation. So the idea here is to casting a step. The form for the step has a, uh, a step and a tread. Now tread, I guess this is a tread and this is a rise, right? So this is the rise and a tread. The top of the form is open because you want to be able to pour concrete into it. And so the concrete goes into the, the component here. It will fill it up to the top. It will remain open. Uh, but the question is, do you have to apply some force on it by a bag of sand to stop it from floating off its foundation and letting all the, the concrete come out from the sides? So, so that's the, the basic question. And so, like many of the things that we do, it's a, a free body. Uh, the easiest free body to take for this is to just draw a free body around the whole thing. And then look at the forces that are within that free body. And so, there is the, um, the geometry of the form. This is open. You have a weight of the sandbag that you're putting on it. You have the weight of the concrete that's inside the form and the weight of the form itself, all acting downwards. Against that, because if you look at the pressure outside this, this would be pressure versus depth. Well, that's not what I'm going to do. Pressure versus depth is going to look something like this. So we know that on the base of the form, we're going to have some pressure A, pressure B acting here, I guess. Pressure B. And so that pressure B is exactly the same pressure that's going to be acting upwards along the base of the form. This is what we're calling PB here. And this magnitude will be, uh, let me draw straight lines. We know the height of this. This is, uh, so the risers are eight inches. So this is eight and eight and eight. This is 10, I think, is that? 10 inch tread. Whoops. These are tens and tens and tens. But this is open. And so we can work out what each of these components are. Free body, we, we take, uh, we resolve in one direction. If we resolve in the downwards y direction, we have the weight of the sand plus the weight of the concrete plus the weight of the form has to be equal to the weight, the, the force acting upwards. The force acting upwards is this pressure multiplied by the area of the base. And so in addition to these uh, lengths here, I guess we know that 8 plus 8 plus 8 is 24. So this is 24 inches total. And I guess the other piece of information we know is that the length into the page is three feet. So 36 inches. So we have to work out what each of these individual components uh, would be. So the question is, so if we resolve, these are the ones in the vertically downwards direction. This is the one in the vertically upwards direction because we've cut off this. Imagine we're cutting out this step with a box around it that completely isolates it. Acting on the outside of this box is this upwards pressure. So this is acting upwards, hence this. And they have to sum to zero if it's not moving. So in other words, this has to be big enough to counter all these other forces. 
And so that's uh, what we're going to figure out. So this is what we want to know. So the weight of the con well, we can calculate all of these. The weight of the form we know. The weight of the form is 85 pounds. So we know that that's 85 pounds. We know what's going to be the pressure. The pressure at B equals the unit weight of concrete multiplied by 24 inches or two feet, whatever that is. Um, da, 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 da. 150 pounds per cubic meter, cubic feet, 24 inches over 12, 300 pounds per feet. So we can get that. So we, we can get this. Directly. The area is going to be what? Cross-sectional area is going to be 10 plus 10 plus 10 going to be 30 inches times 36 inches. If you wanted to, we could divide that by 144, I guess, if we wanted to. So if you look down here, the area, 30 over 12, 3 feet, 7.5 square feet. And so we know both the pressure and the area. I guess the important thing to note is that you know, the pressure under this point here is not equal to this height multiplied by the unit weight, for obvious reasons. But just like in a swimming pool, you'd be feeling the full amount of fluid above you, which is, the fluid in this case is the concrete, which is all the way up to here. So the pressure acting on this point here, because they're all on a horizontal, same horizontal line, they have to be the same, and it has to be equal to this pressure that's acting here. So I guess that's one kind of quirk of this that you need to, to be aware of. Um, and the concrete, you can calculate just by dividing it up. And I think they do it vertically here. So they take the, the volume of concrete is going to be what? It's going to be equal to 24 inches times 10 inches times 36 inches. That's going to be this little segment here. Plus, um, this is going to be 8 plus 8 is 16. 16 inches times 10 inches times 36. It's not working again for me. And it's going to be plus uh, 8 inches times 10 inches. times 36. Obviously we could have taken 36 out and done it a bit more conveniently. So the point is that we have all of the components here. Um, the weight of concrete is going to be equal to the volume of concrete multiplied by the unit weight of concrete. The weight of the form is given. The pressure on the base has to be this depth multiplied by the unit weight of concrete, which is 24 inches times the unit weight of concrete. The area that it acts on has to be the footprint of this, which is 10 plus 10 plus 10, which is 30 times 36 into the page, which is this here. And the only thing we don't know is the weight of sand. And so I won't, given my past performance, I won't try adding those together, but you had them all here. So we know the weight of the concrete. We know the weight of the form. We know the pressure. We know the area. If we're careful with our conversions, which I probably wouldn't be. The only remaining parameter we get is the, the weight of sand that we need. So pretty, not straight, not super straightforward, but, but not insurmountable. The other way you could do it, I, I don't want to confuse you. I mean, I, I don't know where the expression comes from. There's more than one way to skin a cat. I don't know if anyone is here has skinned a cat, but you can solve these in different ways. Let's see if I get rid of this. The other way to do it is you could also do a free body that looked like um, like this. But just 
took the form. And so now this free body would include the weight of the sand that you want to put on it. It would include, it would not include the weight of the concrete. It would include the weight of the form because this is representing the weight of the form. And what in addition it would do is it would include the pressures that are acting up. So we had this diagram before that I erased that gave you pressure versus depth. Let me do it as red. And so the pressure acting at this point here is given by this magnitude. But the pressure acting at this point here is also given by this magnitude. And the pressure acting here is also given by this magnitude. So this would be, if this is point, step number one versus two, this is open, remember. So there's going to be a pressure acting here, which would be pressure one, which would be equal to this length here. This is P1. So the force acting upwards is P1A1. There'd be a slightly lower pressure here acting upwards, which would be P2A2. That would be the force, right? The, the multiplier of these. And so the resolution of this one would be that acting down, you have the weight of the sand, which you don't know. Also acting down would be the weight of the form, which we do know. And subtracted from that would be equal to P1A1 and P2A2. And of course the pressure here is zero, but it's also not acting on anything, and is equal to zero. And so in, instead of drawing a free body diagram last time that encompassed this whole thing, including the, the bottom boundary, which had a pressure acting on it, we're making a free body diagram that only includes the form and the pressures acting on it. And so this is the term we want to know. We know what this is. Uh, we know what these pressures are, right? So P2 would be equal to what? It'd be equal to um, the depth, which is 8 inches, is it? Would be equal to 8 inches times the unit weight of the concrete. And of course, P1 would be equal to 16 inches times the unit weight of concrete. And so here you also have um, only one unknown, so you can solve for the weight of the sand. You could try it if you want. I'm not sure if you do that, want to do that for fun, but it, you'd get exactly the same result. So there's just other ways to, to be able to solve the system. Probably say, uh, easier to do it the, the first way we did it, but that would give you the same result because it's physically the same system. So it's important, and I think you know one of the key things to get in, in this course, especially when we're talking about fluid statics, is to get the idea of how you draw your kind of control volume around your uh, system, because that's most of the, the battle, I think, in doing that. So that's that. So we got through the, the ones, the, the first one was a bit tortuous, wasn't it? Uh, a bit embarrassing, actually. The first one was a suction one that we got through the two foot rise, um, the mercury manometer between the pipes. Uh, the third one was the step with the concrete in it. Um, I'm, I'm not sure we need to, uh, perhaps I'll say something about the slightly compressible fluids one. I don't think it's very, no, it's too complicated a problem to do in class. But the idea is that for all liquids, we said that liquids are essentially incompressible. They, they don't compress very much because they're very stiff. If you actually account for the fact that the water does compress with very high stresses, as you go to the bottom of the Marianas Trench, the density of water at the bottom of the trench is different from the density of water at the top, then you can do a calculation to see exactly what the uh, pressure would be at the bottom of the ocean if you allow um, compressibility of the fluid versus if you don't assume that it's incompressible. And if you allow for compressibility, you get a larger pressure slightly by a fraction here. You know, what is this? This is less than a, a percent, I, I think. 
And the reason for that is if you think of the ocean uh, having some kind of depth to it, and that as you go down with depth, the pressure changes by some amount as you go down for an incompressible fluid, so that this would give you the pressure at the base at some elevation C. If it's incompressible, the mass of fluid you have in the system is a given amount and it doesn't change. If it's compressible, then as you add it, then the upper surface, because it will compress at the bottom, the upper surface will go down a bit. If the other surface goes down, that gives you a bit more room to put fluid in to top it up to the, the amount that it would be otherwise. And so that if you allow for compressibility, you'd expect the, the pressure at very deep depths to be slightly larger than if you assume it's incompressible. So, but the, the difference is trivial, right? It's, uh, it's uh, 0.1 Uh, this would be 61.4. It's about, no, it's about 1%, something of that, a bit more than 1%. It's a trivial. So that's all I'm going to say for now. Um, to, well, homework should have been due, I guess, last night, so that's done. We now have everything we need to do homework number two, so homework two is live. Take Monday off, but however, uh, there's an extra credit quiz to be done for Monday's class. It'd be good if you did it before Wednesday because we'll build on it with Wednesday's class. Um, and it's all online as you'll see. Uh, it'll close, the extra credit quiz will close on Friday at midnight, two, two classes after the class. So I realize it's your Labor Day weekend, our Labor Day weekend. Last year you didn't get one, right? Uh, uh, actually we canceled class on Labor Day last year, uh, even if you uh, the other classes were in session, COVID classes were in session, and people just did this uh, online assignment. So, extra credit, do it if you want. Uh, don't do it if you don't want, it's uh, as you wish. But we will build from it uh, next week. Next week, we'll talk about fluid pressures on surfaces. So, so far, it's been fluid pressures at a point. We'll talk about forces that are applied on surfaces that make planes, fuselages unwrap, make dams fall over make gates open, etc. Uh, that'll be the third week, which will be the end of our statics. At the first lecture on week four, we'll do uh, accelerating fluids. So as we talked the last time, I don't see the hand sanitizer. If you have fluid in a bottle that you're accelerating, then that's also a static fluid problem. And then that's the material fully for the first midterm. And so the first three weeks of class are the, and, and the one class after that are the first midterm, the first midterm will be in week five, right? Monday, Wednesday, Friday, week five. So there's about a week gap between them. And so, and so my plan for that is, as you'll see in the review sessions, there'll be a review session posted that says what material you need to know. The review session will include every single equation you need to, to use for that, but you'll have to figure out how exactly you use it, right? So that's the key. So that's kind of where we are in the class. So that's it.